Hello, and welcome to Arcadia University's BI-327 Histology course. This is the second of the introduction to microscopy lectures, where we're going to be looking at microtechnique. So in essence, looking at how we're going to prepare our specimens to be able to study them underneath the microscope. Now, the basic histological methods, and we're going to put the, the big emphasis on talking about light microscopy now, is that we're going to require very, very thin, translucent, meaning we can project light through them, slices of tissue. You can't take a, a body part, slap it down underneath a microscope, and be able to look at it. We've got to be able to take it, put it onto a microscope slide, and project the light through it. Okay, so the biological tissue is going to have to be modified in some ways. And so these basic processes associated with the histological method are that we're going to have to fix it, we're going to have to dehydrate the tissue, we're going to have to embed the tissue in a supportive media, we're going to have to section it into thin slices, and then ultimately we're going to have to stain it to be able to see uh, specific structures within it. And so fixation, dehydration, embedding, sectioning, and staining are the processes that we're going to look through uh, and understand, hopefully, by the end of this mini-lecture. Now, we want to preserve the structures within our biological organism as close to natural as possible. And so we need to fix it in this state where we can look at it and it hasn't rotted away, it hasn't decayed away, it hasn't broken away. We're able to look at it and be able to look at it underneath the microscope and see something that looks similar to what it would like look like in real life. And so there are two fit, main types of fixatives that we can use. We can use chemical fixatives. Uh, anybody that's been in a, a biology lab uh, looking at um, uh, like fetal pigs or um, basic biology specimens knows about uh, the aldehydes, the formaldehyde, the glutaraldehydes, which are essentially cross-linking proteins. They're gonna link the proteins in place. Uh, we can use osmium, which is a heavy metal, which fixes lipids. We can use alcohol, which is a light fixative, uh, but it still preserves the tissues in some way. So instead of using chemical fixatives, we could also use freezing. You can essentially take the biological specimen, immerse it in liquid nitrogen, freeze it, freeze it very rapidly, and preserve it in as lifelike and natural form as possible. Now, regardless of how we fix these tissues, most biological tissues are going to be too soft to cut into very, very thin slices. And so what we're going to have to do is take our biological specimen, which in general is, is water-soluble because we're, we're an aqueous organism, and support it in something that's insoluble to water. We're going to use either a paraffin wax or a plastic resin. And oil and water don't mix, and these insoluble materials and water, these insoluble materials and biological tissues don't uh, mix real well. And so what we have to do is replace the water within the biological tissues with some type of solvent which is soluble in the supporting media. So basically what we have to do is replace the water fluid within the biological tissues with fluids of other types. And so we'll use things like alcohols and xylenes to remove the water and get the biological tissue into a condition where it will essentially interact with these water insoluble waxes or plastic resins. Once we've done that, we can take the tissue and embed it into some type of supporting medium. Now, primarily for light microscopy, we're going to use a paraffin wax. So we essentially soak our biological tissue in warm wax, put it into a mold, and allow it to cool, and it becomes solidified and it's supported so we can then cut it. The plastic resins, we do the same basic idea. We soak it in liquid resin, then we put it in a mold, and we bake it to harden it into a nice supporting structure around our biological tissue. Once we've got our, our tissue within a, a tissue block, within the, the embedding media, we need to cut it. And so we're going to use a microtome, which is essentially a fancy deli slicer. It essentially allows us to move our biological specimen across the knife and with each kind of cycle within this we're going to move the specimen ahead a little bit so we can cut relatively thin sections generally within the order of about 10 to 15 micrometers of a consistent thickness and then collect those images. Now specimens for light microscopy that are going to be embedded in paraffin 
They're going to be dehydrated, embedded in the wax, and then sectioned using the microtome, usually about 5 to maybe 15 micrometers in uh, thickness of these sections. And these are really good for morphology. They're really good for looking at kind of the anatomical structures associated within the biological tissue we're looking at. But it takes a fair amount of time to process. It can take days in order to be able to prepare the tissues in this way. We can also use frozen section. We talked about the other way of preserving tissues is to freeze it in liquid nitrogen. You freeze it very rapidly. Uh, it's a quick process. It allows you to preserve protein structure. And we'll talk about some ways we can study proteins later on in the course. And we can cut it with essentially a cryostat. And it's the same basic idea. It's basically a microtome, one of these deli slicers for cutting biological tissues, but it's within a refrigeration system. And this again allows us to section it and collect these tissues without thawing them out and preserve them and study them in some way. Plastic resins, uh, we said, are often used uh, as another embedding media. This is used for electron microscopy where we have to come up with very, very, very thin sections instead of on the order of 5 to 15 micrometers, we're dealing with sections that are less than a micrometer thickness. These are great for electron microscopy, very, very good for high resolution, very good for morphology, but it takes a lot of time uh, and specialized equipment to prepare them. But it's the same basic idea. We're going to use a microtome, an ultra microtome in this point, uh, very fancy, very expensive, but it's essentially the same idea as the deli slicer. So that once we collect our sections, uh, our slices of tissue, are going to be referred to as sections, we need to be able to study them. And so when we take a look at them, most biological tissues are translucent, which means if we project light through them, we're not going to see anything. The light's going to pass through. So what we want to do is add selective contrast. We're going to use chemicals that are going to go through, bind to specific structures, specific characteristics within our biological tissues, and then we're going to look at where those chemicals have, in essence, added selective contrast, where they've added color. Now, the most common type of uh, staining method used in light microscopy is hematoxylin and eosin. It's a combined stain. The first part of this is hematoxylin. Hematoxylin, depending upon the, the, the amount there, can stain blue or purple or black. And this is referred to as a basophilic stain. Uh, what this means is, as a basophilic stain, it's going to bind to things that are acidic. It's going to bind through things like RNA and DNA. And so it's going to give this blue or purple or black appearance to things that have a lot of DNA or RNA. So it's things like the nucleus of the cell, where the DNA is going to be located. The nucleus, where we have a condensed region of, of DNA and RNA. Ribosomes and rough endoplasmic reticulum, where we've got RNA, which is going to be present. All of these structures are going to stain blue or black because of the hemotoxylin. The second component is going to be eosin. Eosin is going to be a pink to red stain. It's going to be referred to as acidophilic, and it's going to bind to things like amino acids, and so it's going to bind to things with lots and lots of proteins. So in this case, we're looking at muscle cells, and it's got packed in uh, actinomyosin filaments within the cytoplasm, and so it's going to have this very pink staining appearance associated with it. There's some other specialized stains that we'll take a look at as we're going through the, the course. One example of this is the periodic acid shift, uh, the PAS reaction, which is a specialized stain for carbohydrates. So glycogens, glycoproteins, prote proteoglycans are going to stain red or magenta. And so you can see in this example here, We've got some goblet cells that are staining kind of purplish or reddish in appearance. Again, as a specialized stain that we can use and study these. Masson's trichrome strain is, again, a specialized stain for looking at connective tissue. And so in this case, the collagens are staining kind of a greenish blue, in this case a more blue appearance. And so we can look at the relationship between the cells, the cytoplasm, and the collagen uh, using these types of specialized stains. Now, more recently, uh, there's been a mechanism in which we can go through and study very specific proteins. We said that ESN is very good for studying general proteins, but you might want to identify where a specific protein is going to be found within a cell or within a tissue. Now, the process of immunohistochemistry or immunocytochemistry allows for the visualization of specific proteins. And the way this works is that we essentially use antibody staining. 
Antibodies are natural molecules produced within the body which bind to foreign proteins. And so what you do in immunohistochemistry is that you create antibodies essentially within a different organism. In this case, we've got a, a diagram showing a rabbit antibody. So you take the human protein, inject it into a rabbit. The rabbit recognizes that as being a foreign material and produces antibodies against it. Within the rabbit, those antibodies are going to bind to that protein and identify them so the immune system can eliminate them. What we're going to do is collect those antibodies, purify them, and then use them as a staining method. And so what we can do is take a rabbit anti or rabbit primary antibody against the, the little A uh, pyramids, A tents, whatever we're looking at here. And we're essentially going to allow this to, antibody to bind to our biological specimen. And it's going to tag it. And then we're going to use a second antibody, which either has a fluorescent molecule or a chromogen, something that's going to cause a chemical reaction and a, a colored reaction product to form. So we can go through and find our specific protein, in this case, our, our little A, you know, green triangles, on our biological specimen. And again, this allows us to go much more detailed than just general generic proteins within the cell by being able to study where the specific protein that we're interested in studying is going to be located and what factors can cause upregulation or downregulation of these proteins. So this is a very valuable method in which we can study proteins within the cell. An example of this is essentially antibody staining using immunohistochemistry. So this is looking at a myenteric ganglia. We'll talk about this later on within the course. But essentially, we've got green staining where tyrosine hydroxylase is present. And so this helps identify a subset of axons uh, within the body. And we've got blue staining, which are postganglionic neurons. And so we can learn a lot more specific information about the types of cells and what these cells are doing by using these processes of antibodies and immunohistochemistry. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.